Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Burgundy Zone. I am your host, Kyle. I am joined by a special guest, again, Adam Aniba. How you doing, sir? Good. Thanks for having me on, man. Of course, and we have a bunch to get into. We talked last week on Monday pre-draft, and wow, the way uh, things shaped out. There were a couple picks uh, that we have to go over that stunned a, a lot of people. And look, Chase Young is the obvious pick there at number one. But we first have to get into the third round pick, Antonio Gibson, the running back slash wide receiver from Memphis. What was your first uh, thought when the Redskins went and picked him there? I was a little surprised, honestly. Uh, I was actually on a podcast um, about a week earlier talking about how I really liked him. We did a, a live mock draft and I had him in the fourth round, actually. So um, I was happy we got him. I was just surprised we got him a little earlier. But, you know, here a lot of the analysis afterwards, it sounds like, you know, there was thought that he could be off the board before their fourth round pick. So, um, you know, I think a lot of people got caught up with uh, the discussion that he was simply a running back. He's a lot more than that. Um, he is, a, to my opinion, he is definitely more of a wide receiver. Um, he, you know, he basically was playing positions of need in Memphis, wherever they needed him. And, you know, basically on his numbers, he had a 19.3 yards average per reception and 11.2 yards per run. Uh, pretty even, uh, 38 catches and 33 runs. Um, pr- put in a box is basically a one-year wonder uh, because he was a community college uh, his first two years. Junior year uh, really was just more mm. special teams. Um, but he's also a dynamic returner. I just think that... Um, what they're trying to do is just create more speed, more mismatches. Um, you know, think what Philadelphia used to do with Westbrook and Darren Sproles yep. in the backfield. From what I'm hearing, this is what we're going to see. So he'll be a lot more of a receiver than he will be a running back. He does have some deficiencies in running back that, you know, I, I think question some of the people with the pick at 66. But third round, you know, they got guys in the second round prior to that. So I think we got him, you know, I think in the end we're going to end up getting a steal because, you know, at six foot near 220, he's a big guy. But, you know, run the 40 at 4'3", you know, he's he's definitely explosive, 35-inch uh, vertical, played basketball. I love that with our uh, yep. football players. So I, I think, uh, you know, it's going to be a slow transition for him coming from Memphis. But I think um, it's just another weapon that we're adding. And I think uh, Turner Jr.'s, basically trying to recreate what he was trying to do the last four uh, weeks in Carolina when the offense was given to him. Um, But I'm excited. You know, the first two picks uh, after Chase Young, they were two guys that I spent a lot of uh, film work on, and I loved his film, so I'm really excited that we got him. Yeah, and with Antonio Gibson, when I watched him on film, the one thing that that jumped out to me, the one way I described him, was that he was a a semi-truck that could launch off into space. Um, it right. doesn't make much sense, but he runs through blocks. I mean, through tackles. He is a hard runner, but also he can dip out in a flash. And, right, and, right. And that kind of – usually you don't see that uh, in a combination with a runner. Um, the one thing with him is when you look at it, it makes you wonder, does Ron Rivera and Scott Turner believe that they don't have a difference maker in the backfield right now? Right. Um, because I know that the, his coach at Memphis was on 106.7 today and talked about how he will be used more as a running back, and that makes a lot of sense because, look, they have the speed on the outside. We saw that last year. It's just right. can you look at the running back room right now and say I'm confident in the playmakers there? And that's where I'm at sitting there thinking they're not. Uh, they don't really right. have it because Bryce Love's coming off an injury. You can't, re- you, you can't trust Geis as far as you can throw him. I love, his, I love him as a, as a person and a player, but – you know, you just cannot trust him to stay on the field. So the way I looked at it is that they went and they got a playmaker like a McLaurin type at the running back position that they can put out on the outside. Yeah, yeah. I I, I think just take it with a grain of salt right. about the, the discussion about putting him in the um, backfield. Because, you know, when Fred Smoot asked him, you know, you view yourself as a running back receiver – quickly his answer was i'm a weapon and i think that the, of course the team he's going to be listed as a running back he's not listed as a receiver so the easy answer is sure we're going to put him in the backfield but um basically in the end what's going to happen is he's just going to be more of a weapon like he said he's going to be somebody that can come in especially on third downs i think that's where we're going to see him early on is uh i heard kick return we're going to see him mm-hmm. day one plug and play and third downs is where we're going to see him come in with a running back and I'm starting to believe now that the reason that they didn't go, you know, more aggressively for a tight end and wait until the undrafted free agency is because I think more of their plan is going to be centered around game plans like this with multi-set running backs 
rather than multi-set tight end. So I think you're going to see more sets with a single tight end in the game, uh, especially on passing down. It's going to be very different what we saw on the West Coast with Jay. And, uh, you know, just study up on the air carriel, you know, if if fans are trying to figure out what we're going to do. That's going to be a little bit what Turner's bringing to the table, which is a a little bit what his father ran, but he's going to be, you know, what he liked to run in Carolina. So the talk about, um, you know, duplicating what they did over there from what I'm hearing from a lot of people is you're going to see a hybrid from over there. And, you know, Mm. McCaffrey, that's not what they're going to use him for. You know, he's going to be more of a flex receiver. I personally think I'm hoping we're going to see more Bryce Love in that mode because he went to school with McCaffrey. So a lot of that Stanford concept, you know, I think, you know, again, you mentioned health is definitely an issue, yeah. but um, I have confidence. Everything I've read, you know, he's had a single injury and that's his whole career from high school to college to ACL in 2018. You know, we're approaching well over two years since that injury. So personally, I think Bryce Love's going to come in and he's probably going to be one of the, one of the main uh, focal points. But I think we're going to see, you know, a running back by committee. But um, we're going to be doing a lot of things that are trying going to confuse the defense is basically just trying to give Dwayne Haskins as much time as possible. Uh, because they know that, you know, this line is still not a finished product and the more speed we can put on the field, the better. And that's definitely what Gibson gives us. Yeah, absolutely. And when my first reaction was, you know, who, who? like, you know, yeah. with, with because <laughs> yeah. everything we talked about, you know, we thought with Troutman being available there that they would right. pull the trigger. Um, and that was the case. Uh, I liked their mindset with this because, you know, I told my father-in-law, he asked the question, like, why, you know, why would they go this right. route? They don't need a running back or a wide receiver. And I sat right. there and thought, you know, this is an X's and O's move. Yeah, you know, to the right. fan, this doesn't make much sense. But to of course. the chess match that coaches go through on a play-by-play basis, this kid offers another ability where the defense has to hold him accountable for the deep field because he can at any moment take the ball deep. And I'm, that is why they got him. I, uh, from right. what I heard from J.P. Finley, that this was Kyle Smith's guy. And they went out and he got him and best of luck to him because if this is a dude that they think they can plug in right away and that can be a difference maker, I'm excited to see it to this offense. Right, right. I think yeah, you know, you're you just said hit the nail on the head. You know, for fans that just studied up on you know guys before the draft, you know, but you know if you've been like going through the class through the last year or so, Gibson is a name that's continually come up on a lot of people with mocks and you know. But like I said, you know, for some reason a lot of people typecast him as a running back. But prior to this, prior to the draft, everyone I talked to, everyone that did evaluations was really looking at him as a receiver. And, you know, I see no reason if he can just clean up some of his routes. He's a little stiff at times, but, you know, uh, basic, a lot of what he does well can't be taught and a lot of what he needs to do better can be. So, you know, I think Ron Rivera went out of his way to explain that, you know, they're going to be teaching these players. And I think Gibson is the perfect guy for them to mold in this offense. Yeah. And the one thing that also jumped out to me from watching his film was the return ability and him, the special teams ability that he has. And he has a natural vision uh, for the field. And I know that I'm watching his games and navigating through the special teams. Nobody even touches him. And he's dodging three or four guys at a time, but it's just because of his speed and his vision. He's able to get outside. I'm very intrigued by this prospect because just by special teams alone, I think he's going to be a difference maker. No doubt. No doubt about it. Because I've heard people say, well, we had Steven Sims and he was good at special teams. Well, I think he's, you know, to me, there's no reason why he's not the starting slot. And yeah. I think you got to watch out for that. And that I think, injury you know, concern. you, you got to keep them away from, you know, special teams. And I think, you know, again, to later on, you know, that's why you saw a lot of these picks that were head scratchers because uh, Rivera has always been a special teams defense guy and building special teams with talent, with speed. Um, with production, most notably, is yeah. what they're trying to do. And I think when you have your uh, role players like him, you know, you got to get them off special teams and get more people to fill the role. So, you know, I think it's going to be the same with Cole Holcomb. You know, he's going to be more moved to, uh, you know, a starting role. So mm-hmm. thus, you know, some of the later round picks to fill those uh, roles on special teams. Yeah. And so speaking of versatility, um, let's move on to their next uh, pick in their early fourth round which I think we all, this, the consensus around Redskins Nation right now is that that was a steal in the fourth round, Sadiq Charles, the left tackle from LSU. Sure. Uh, I watched his tape. Um, I wasn't 100% impressed because where he was being right. mocked was around like the second to third. But getting him in the fourth, uh, to me, was an absolute yeah. steal and made a lot more sense given the fact that the Redskins did end up shipping Trent Williams. So they have a need at left tackle. And look, they did sign Cornelius Lucas. I know everyone continues right. to forget about Lucas. 
He started the last four games to the Chicago Bears and did it well at left tackle. Right. He could very well earn that left tackle spot and allow Charles to kick inside. What did you think about that pick? Yeah, honestly, I loved it because, you know, I, I watched some film with him, but I did a little more research after the pick. And uh, basically, there was some concerns, you know, no arrest, nothing crazy. From right. what I understand, it, it stemmed from, you know, marijuana and, um, you know, I guess multiple times tested positive with the, with the coach. This is what's leaking out now. But I think with the new NFL and the new CBA, you know, the new the rules of a TA testing for THC, it's going to be monetary uh, punishments. It's not going to be any kind of suspension. So I'm not worried about it. I also, when I heard him talking with uh, uh, the fan, not the fan, uh, some I think it was on 980, mm -hmm. uh, he basically said, you know, he, he's only 20 years old. Uh, he was dealing with maturity issues. He's ready to be a professional. And I think there's no better team in, you know, and a coach in Rivera to, uh, you know, set the discipline. And I think that's what this kid needs. And to be going against this kind of defensive line day in and day out, man, this kid has no chance but to rise to the occasion. I think coming from LSU on the biggest stages in college football, I think people just need to remember, you know, as good as Joe Burrow was, man, this guy was blocking his blind side. And he did a damn good job about it, especially getting out in space. You know, I have some issues when he's just asked to be, you know, a straight inline blocker. But I really like what he does in space, and that's what uh, you know. Go, going to you know the modern day NFL, we're asking linemen to do things like that. So I think he'll be good. Will he be a starter right away? I'm not sure. You you know you mentioned about kicking into guard. That's the floor for me. Ceiling for me is I think he can be a starting left tackle for ten years. The floor is kick inside the guard. You know maybe even right tackle. But I think we have some decent guard depth that that won't even be necessary. So I think in the beginning, you no know, swing tackle might be where he goes to start. Yeah, the only reason I say that is because, you know, he has all the physical traits. You know, he has the long arms. Right. He has the strength and the athleticism to get out in space. The only issue a lot of times it's, it has to do with his fundamentals, uh, taking the right depth right. with his steps and everything. And in the NFL, that can be an injury concern to your quarterback. And that's the only reason why I'm concerned. But obviously, we have the offseason to go through. We have to trust Ron Rivera being able to develop his guys uh, and being able to get Sadiq Charles up and ready. Uh, the only reason I say that is hoping with optimistic view that Cornelius Lucas uh, stuns some people uh, in preseason, right. maybe early on in training camp and kind of solidifies himself there. And the Redskins sitting there thinking to themselves, look, we have a plethora of talent here. We have to put our best athletes on the field. And uh, I don't see a reason why to put Sadiq Charles in there uh, to be able to learn the position right. inside and then being able to kick outside once he, his game kind of slows down for him. You know, at first it's going to be fast. Uh, for him right. in the, here in the NFL. But I think a guard, uh, and and one thing in particular I wanted to take away, I thought, if I'm Ron Rivera, I'm putting his locker right in between Adrian Peterson and uh, Terry McLaurin. You know, I want to make course, sure definitely. that he's learning from the best and that those two, just keeping him busy during this time, you know, because a lot of times these young guys, they get in trouble. But if he's, if he's staying busy with Terry McLaurin and AP, I don't see any reason why this kid can't be uh, the left tackle for 10 years. Yeah, no, I, I think I think you know probably as far as value goes, um, he was probably one of the best value picks because I had um, an early third round grade, you know, potentially second round. I did find, like I said, found some flaws in his game, but honestly, after the first four five offensive tackles, you know, all these guys are you know works in progress. Even the, you know, some some of the top guys. Even so, Ezra I think exactly. Definitely Ezra Cleveland, you know, and I think, again, you know, it's all about competition and being able to go against these guys day in and day out that the Redskins have built on this defensive line. I think it's only going to make him better. So, yeah. you know, the competition he faced in the NS SEC, it's speed of the game always. But you have to understand, look how many players, you know, 14 alone, I think, came out of LSU. And then I think SEC was a record that were drafted. So a lot of the guys he faced are NFL talent. So I think that it's more about him refining his technique than getting, you know, um, acclimated to the programs, right. pro game. So, you know, I, I'm, I like the pick, and it, it was great value, especially after we traded Trent Williams. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't think there's going to be anybody in the D.C. area that uh, thought that was a bad pick. Um, now, the I think the steal right. of the draft uh, was the compensatory pick in the fourth round by the Washington Redskins. They went and got Antonio Gandy-Golden. Uh, the wide receiver from Liberty. Yep. I was on live stream cheering my lungs out when they made this yep. pick because I, I heard Ron Rivera in the offseason talk. They needed a number two wide receiver, and I did not think Antonio Gibson was doing that for them. I absolutely nope. love this pick. Tell Redskins fans why the Redskins made the right decision. Yeah, I spent a ton of time. I think probably 
out of any wide receiver in the draft um, I, because a uh, small school prospect evaluation is basically my main thing. What I do, I watch all film, but that's where I spend the most time, you know, as soon as the, you know, probably starting from, you know, November on. And um, he was a guy that I just loved. You know, some people might think this is high praise, but just keep it in mind, this is, you know, early on. I'm looking at a lot of Terrell Owens um, coming out of Tennessee, Chattanooga, uh, just about 6'3", 213, 465. Gandy Golden was about 4'6". Um, you know, the short shuttle for Owens was 426. Gandy goes about 4'5". So, you know, it's high praise, but, you know, I'm not talking about Terrell Owens in his mid-career. I'm talking about when they came out. Yeah. I see a lot of similarities between the two. I'm not big on comps. But, you know, I just someone I heard someone talk about Terrell Owens coming out of the small school. So I said, let me, you know, let me look at some of that film. And I just put it side by side. And I was really surprised, especially when it comes to the catch radius. That's what I see in connection to both two is the catch radius in the hands. Uh, in 2018, he definitely had some concentration drops. Hmm. But it's one of those guys that he makes a spectacular catch. But in 18, he was, you know, it was too wide open. He would drop him. Right. In 2019, he was not making that mistake. It was back-to-back 1,000-yard seasons, spectacular catch after spectacular catch. And I think he's going to be able to thrive in the role that we're going to put him in. We're not going to put him in a situation where he's going to be the guy, the go-to guy. That's McLaurin. So what this guy's going to deal with, he's going to deal with a lot of one-on-one coverage. And if you just look around the NFL, granted, a lot of they're having some bigger corners. But there's a ton of smaller corners out here, and that's who he feasted on. So I think, you know, early on, you're probably going to see him more as a red zone threat. I'm hearing that there's still talk about doing some things with Harmon. I don't know if it's... You know, a tight end a hybrid H back role. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I believe it because I think he's a receiver. That's what he should stay at. But he's probably the best blocking receiver on the team. So I think in, early on, um, AGG, we're going to be looking at you know red zone option from because those you know the, those back shoulders, those fades. That's what he does well, and that's what you know Redskins have not done well. And honestly, we can go back to you know Michael Westbrook. And <laughs> so it's going back back way you know a long time ago yeah. to I feel that we had a, a dependable tall threat yeah. in the red zone. And I just think, you know, I spent so much time watching what he does, and I just loved his game. And just like you, just like a couple people that, you know, that I talked to all the time, we did the live stream as well, that we were really excited when we yeah. got him, especially there, because I had him as a third-round value, potentially early, depending on how many receivers went on. So to get him at the end of the fourth round, which is basically almost a fifth round with that compensatory pick, man, I, w- I, w- I was – psyched out of my mind that we got that pick yeah and you and you were not alone uh that was no. a slam dunk in my opinion and i the one thing with him that i keep hearing like for 106 i heard earlier that they were saying well he's a big guy you know so he can't be all that fast and it's like wait wait, wait no you're you gotta watch him and you got to see that he can right. literally even going against press. Um, he has yeah. the ability to separate himself. He runs really refined routes. Um, I loved his film. I, re- I remember saying this. The corner needed therapy after Antonio. He ran again. He ran a comeback on the corner. And the corner lost his right. footing. He fell on his stomach. Right. That's how well he right. ran that route. And I, I really don't like that kind of mantra about the bigger wide receivers because I think he there's a, right. he deserves a lot more credit with his footwork. I think he can run the full yeah. route tree. And yeah. I feel bad for Kelvin Harmon because at this point he kind of seems like the odd man out given the fact that they have the speed in the slot with Steven Sims. Um, and so I think credit right. to right. him for them even thinking that they could push him into inside the to tight end. Yeah, yeah. No, I, 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 the competition is going to be fierce. It, um, tight. Uh, excuse me, to wide receiver. But um, just like the defensive line, I think you know, with the exception of McLaurin, you're going to see a lot of interchangeable pieces and a lot of offensive um, um, personnel moved in and out. And I think the reason we're going to see that is because teams are just bringing so many different kind of looks with you know multiple safeties in the games taking out their linebackers you know a lot more nickel packages are playing around in the league you know i think the average is somewhere between 60 to 70 percent you're seeing nickel nickel dime formations so i think to be able to bring somebody like him and that's a big body receiver to you know in certain situations he could have a safety going against him depending on how many you know pass catches we have in the game so i think that you know it's a mistake right now to put anybody in a box as you know wide receiver two wide receiver three wide receiver four because i think after mclaurin it's going to be a bunch of guys that are interchangeable because you know this is the youngest we've ever seen you know i've been a fan 
forever, you know, since the 83 Super Bowl, 82 Super Bowl. And um, this is the youngest I've seen them go at rush receiver, but it's the most balanced. We've always had, you know, too many small guys. Yeah. And then we had, like I said, Michael Westbrook, Albert Connell. We had, you know, a bunch of tall guys that, you know, couldn't really get downfield as fast as some of the other guys around the league. Mm. So I think they have a really good balance right now. And adding in, you know, uh, scat backs, adding in different weapons. I just think this is only going to help Dwayne Haskins. And a lot of the knock is, you know, did we help him? And granted, they're unproven and it's on paper. But in my opinion, they did. Because like you say, go, they're talking about, you know, four, four, six speed with him. For a guy that's 6'4", that's a lot faster than a, a smaller guy running a 4'6". Yeah. That's long strides. That's somebody getting in a f- downfield in a hurry. And the fact that his catch, his catch radius and his hands right now are his best attribute. Um, I do like, you know, there's, as far as Rotary goes, there's a couple, you know, the comebacks, the slants. That's what he's really good at. But a lot of people are questioning his toughness going through the middle. I don't think it's really about his toughness. I just think what his team was running really yeah. wasn't asking him to do too much of that. Yeah. So I think we're going to see a lot of things that, you know, he probably wasn't doing in college. It'll take a little time for him to get going, but man, what a great pick it was. Yeah, and I don't I don't mean to, you know, be negative or try to throw anybody under the bus, but watching that quarterback position, it seemed like the only way they could get the ball to uh, Antonio Gandy golden was up in the air away from the line of scrimmage. Yeah. You know, it, it, they didn't really have anything structured over the middle there for Antonio Gandy golden to do well. Now in regards to exactly. the draft, uh, Kyle Smith, it almost seemed like, you know, this was the cutoff point where they kind of looked at themselves and said, you know what? We won this draft. You know, we got Chase I Young. So. We got our weapon on offense to the running back position. And then we got a maybe a possible stabilizing force uh, on the wep- uh, in the wide receiver number two. And then our left tackle, Sadiq Charles. They next now go for depth. And they go get Keith uh, Ishmael. Yeah. I- I'm not sure if I'm saying that wrong. He is the center yeah. from San Diego State. D- have you watched any Correct. film on him? What have you taken away from him? Um, I did. I did watch a little pre-draft, but I watched a lot of the other guys after the draft concluded. And granted, it was a little bit of a reach. I think there was tight ends on the board. There was other positions on the board that I was kind of scratching my head. But after I, you know, looked into their their roster and looked at what they have, you know, granted, we all know it. We look at the roster constantly. But just looking at contracts and looking where players are, um, we have to keep in mind. I think Royer, um, mm-hmm. I think he's got one more year on his deal. Um, Good, good, good uh, center, you know, no complaints about him. But is he all world is should he be penciled in as a starter for, for the next five, 10 years? I'm not sure about that. And I think what what uh, Keith Ishmael brings is a versatility to play guard and center, yeah. play both sides, left and right and center. What I loved about him was his low center of gravity and his pure strength. Mm. He's another guy just like Sadiq Charles, who you can send him out and he actually is good in space. And I think there was a conscious effort to find big bodies, but big bodies that are athletic and he got a lot of praise you know when i think redskins selected him i had um a lot of his actually his teammates follow me when i started uh you know kicking out some of his clips on uh twitter yeah. and a lot of them were like man this guy and, and they were dming me and saying you know believe this guy is probably going to be one of the most underrated linemen in the draft you know he's a hard worker uh he's a grinder he's going to come in and do everything the coaches ask him to do and I think, you know, you know, with Wes Martin, uh, with the situation with Brandon going up in the air, he's franchised. I and in all likelihood, I think they, you know, they have the money. I see no reason why they're not going to extend him. But I don't think that there's really any position on our line where we're saying we're locked. We're fine for the next five, 10 years. To me, I think it's up in the air. So, you know, to have to grab a guy like this in the fifth round, I think it was good value, even though you could argue there was more talent. But. I think we need to, you know, really rely on what um, Kyle Smith and Rivera, you know, they said they worked together. They worked together great. And they were on the same page with all the selection. It wasn't, you know, he wanted him more. They were all on the same page. So I right now, you know, until they give me reason not to, I trust their vision, especially with mid to late round picks, because that's where Kyle Smith has really, you know, nailed it. So I, I, I like the pick. Um, again, it's, it's about value and about what they, you know, feel is the most important to need. And, um, you know, I think every fans just need to come to keep in mind another wave of cuts. It's slowly coming right now. We're second in the NFL with cap, I think, over close to 35 million or so. Mm -hmm. And I don't think they're done yet. I think we're still going to grab a couple players. Uh, Some big names get released every year. So I think this is as soon as we start to hit the fifth round, we're, we're talking about depth now. Yeah, and that's exactly what I think Keith Ishmael brings. 
Um, because when you think about it, if the Redskins were to lose Chase Royer at any point during the season to injury, whatever have you, you got to think to yourself, okay, well, who's playing center? You, yeah. like Nobody comes to mind. And that's the thing with the Redskins' depth right now at offensive line. I know it's quickly, you know, it's funny how fast uh, the NFL is, especially with turnover. That a couple of years ago, you know, offensive line, was you could say, was probably the most talented in uh, regards to depth that we had on this football team. And now it, it seems to be the weakest, um, especially right. when you start looking at the future and looking from a year or two now that we could be possibly without Royer, uh, Sheriff, and Moses. We, we don't know what the heck's going on here. Uh, so right. I like right. that pick by uh, Keith Ishmael. And the one thing that put, uh, points out to me is last year, uh, one of the reasons why I knew that Terry McLaurin was the guy. He was the best valued pick that they had gotten last year because I watched a video that morning after about his friends talk about, uh, about his former teammates talk about him, how he was a role model. I listened to uh, uh, Meyer talk about him. Hearing stuff like that with guys coming out, reaching out to you, DMing you, that's mm-hmm. the kind of stuff that tells you that we have a football player in our hands and right. that he could right. honestly be great. And I hope that he gets some – uh, starting reps this season because the Redskins are going to need it. Yeah, yeah. You know, Jim Nagy from the Senior Bowl, you know, you know, back and forth, you know, right after the Senior Bowl, you know, like I was talking to him here and there, and um, that was somebody that he mentioned with, a, you know, a couple other offensive linemen, you know, to watch in this draft. So it wasn't like he was a no-name. Right. He was just somebody that nobody was really talking about, and I think people – Look at our depth, and you mentioned, you know, if Roya goes down, you know, people are really high on, you know, I'm Alabama fan, and, you know, Pierce, uh, Pierce Bacher, a lot of people are high on him. I'm not. Um, I, I think he, he's a guy, um, you know, he could, he's a utility kind of guy. I don't like him at guard at all. So you're talking about a guy that's really just a straight center. And I really think, you know, when I watch both of their film again, that, um, you know, Ishmael's um, low center of gravity gives him a leg up over Pierce Bacher. Mm-hmm. And in the end, you know, we're, um, the, with the new CBA rules, they're, you know, able to have more players in the roster, more at day active, uh, game day active players. And that's been extended to offensive linemen, additional offensive linemen. So that'll help people like that. So just adding more people that have the versatility to play center and guard, I see exactly what they're doing. So, you know, I, I like the pick. Yeah, and um, and speaking of Ross Piersbarger, it begs the question, you know, going to Alabama, you know, how much help did he have, uh, you know, with Keith right. it, right. Ishmael going to San Diego State, you know, you have to beg the question how much help that he had. Now, moving on, right. the, the linebacker at pick 162 in the fifth round, their second selection, the fifth, they went and got Kaliki Hudson, the linebacker from Michigan. I watched a little bit of his tape, um, and I'm actually really excited about this kid. He's a good yeah. blitzer. Um, I would like yeah, to see too. Jack Del Rio use him like that. And the other aspect of his game that I enjoyed watching was his press against tight ends at the line of scrimmage. You know, he'd, he would yeah. he would line up as the edge rusher and then play one-on-one against the tight end. A lot of times, the tight ends could not get away from him. How much did you like this pick? He's really strong. That's one yeah. thing I liked about him. A furry um, on the I bench, think, I believe. Yeah, yeah. And everyone's thought, you know, the type cast him as the outside linebacker. Do not be surprised if he's, you know, I know linebackers, what they're talking about, but, you know, a sub package, strong safety, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. I would not be surprised with Del Rio and seeing some of the things he's done in the past where you have three safeties in the game where you have a Landon Collins, you know, and whoever else that they're going to, you know, even Fuller, who they have a cornerback, they could drop him in, you know, subsets. But I see somebody like him where you could have him as a blitzing safety um, as a pure outside linebacker. I don't see him as a strong and I don't really see him as a, um, uh, uh, I don't, I don't see him as a will. Yeah. So I think that he's one of those guys out of position. I think he probably instantly um, pushes um, Josh Harvey Clemens off the roster. I don't think he was going to make it anyways. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, after Ishmael, I thought the, the last three picks, more than likely, depending on who, if they bring in, I really think you could see these guys probably developed on the practice squad mm. because I think that that's, you know, something that Rivera talked about in the past that's really important. I think with Jay Gruden, he had no emphasis on that once whatsoever, especially when it came to quarterbacks or anyone developed on the practice squad. He took whoever was left. That's not how you build. Practice squads yeah. are extremely valuable. You know, I grew up with a couple of people that that's as far as they got on the NFL level, and they made it clear they're in demand. They're really – they're asked to do a ton in practice. So the more experience and the more versatility that you can have on your practice squad, the better. And I really see somebody like him as somebody that could really benefit. You know, he filled the staff boxes at Michigan, you know, the last couple of years. But I really feel that he's somebody that can really benefit. You know, we have a couple one-year deals going with our linebackers. 
he's somebody that will be ideally on the practice squad and let's see how you know he gets through this year but um yeah. i think it's 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 something that at worst special teams depth and i think that's another thing that we're going to be building um with some of these late round picks yeah and he was definitely known there in michigan for blocking a couple uh kicks so look right the depth you for said special, it. special teams makes um a heck of a lot of sense i i like his game but he needs a lot of refinement um and yes. when you're speaking of the four three you know you're you're having to move a lot out in space and you alluded to it uh perfectly he could be lining up in that nickel or dime package kind of uh uh, corner or, you know, second DB. A lot of people call it right. you know, Vapor or uh, a Rover, if you will. Right. And he has that ability out in space. And so when you're talking about right. a 4-3, you have to be able to have that speed to move out there in the passing situations. And that's where I could see Kaliki Hudson, if there is an emergency in the season, him right. needing right. to come in in uh, you know, long downs and distances, just being able to cover or, or getting on tight ends. And we've seen that happen. We've seen yeah. how many times over the last couple of years have we've seen these practice squad rives, you know, you know, to the, you know, to base again, and me, me and it feel play, playing time. Like you yeah. said it, you know, he played this Viper role at Michigan. So I definitely, that's why when I, when you say practice squad this day and age, it doesn't mean, you know, they're going to be there and they're not going to play. Right. What that means is that's where they're going to start. And, you know, a lot of times these guys at some point in the season are, are going to get moved up. So I think, you know, that's where he's going to be ultimately just basically, um, because I, I really like a lot of people are knocking our linebackers and I really like a lot of the linebackers. I just think they're unproven. I think with this defensive line, we're going to be able to do some really creative things. You know, there's going to be a, a, not a lot of laundry for them to get through. I think that they're going to have a lot of clear paths to the quarterback. So I really like some of the linebackers we have. So someone like him, it, you could definitely look at it as a luxury, but I look at it as planning for the future. Yeah, and given that Jack Del Rio, a former linebacker, a linebacker specialist, is going to be coaching them up, you have to imagine that, look, I know everyone doesn't like our linebackers, but Jack Del Rio is probably going to get more than what of anybody course. else would. Um, and no that's doubt. what I'm banking on. And they've thrown a lot of options at that linebacker position. And I love that idea. It's basically throwing pasta at the wall and seeing which one sticks. And yeah. there's no better option for that at a position of need, especially in a, in a 4-3 where the linebackers are so pivotal. Uh, they are very right. necessary. Um, now, out of the last two, uh, in round sevens, mm -hmm. they had two picks, two selections. Cameron Curl and they had James Smith Williams. S Williams is, from, is an edge rusher from NC State, and Cameron Curl is a safety from Arkansas. Out of any of these two, do, did any of them jump off the film at you at all? Um, definitely not Curl. Uh, out of all the picks, he was, to me, the most disappointing. Even though it was so late, I understand. But I, I saw other guys on the board. Like, you could even argue, you know, I wasn't a huge – so many people were huge on wide receiver KJ Hill from Ohio State, and he actually went undrafted. But that's somebody that I would have actually looked at right mm -hmm. there, just for, you know, for simple you know uh, depth competition purposes, because I just feel that he's a, a way too slow to be a safety in the NFL. Um, in time, maybe he they'll he can try to add some weight. You know, running the four six, he runs a slow four six, yep. really stiff. I really wasn't a fan, and it's just my early prediction now. I don't see him making the team. I see maybe practice squad, yep. but I think that there's going to be better safeties out there to even put on the practice squad. But James Smith Williams, I think, you know, I had, again I had people from uh, uh, NC State reach out to me, and they were saying this kid is good. The only reason he dropped was injuries. Yeah, um, he had some durability concerns, and a lot of people said if that didn't happen, he would have definitely been like a top seventy-five prospect. So I think that that was great value. He yeah. runs the four six, you know, he's an aggressive uh, pass rusher, and I think you know two sixty, like six four and change. I think he really fits what we're trying to do. The question is, what are we going to do with Ryan Anderson? Yeah. Um, a lot of people have talked about him as, you know, one of the outside linebackers. I, you know, and I know you can go back to the Alabama tape. You even have people talking about middle linebacker, just the way that Saban used him in some packages. But yeah. honestly, I, don't trust I, I think that he's more of a pass rusher. That's really yeah. what I see him down. You know, with the, I think a lot of the damage that he did was as a straight pass rusher. So, you know, between, you know, him and the other guys we got, we're kind of rich in that position right now so i think that you know uh J james smith williams i think a practice squad is definitely his destination and you know hopefully he can keep it together and stay healthy and that's something we can groom for the future but yeah these these last two guys zero i think zero way they make the team and, and again practice squad could be a stretch too yeah the james smith williams i actually liked his tape a lot i had to watch a 2018 film because of the injuries and that's the one thing that jumped out to right. you uh, the coach gave him the number one jersey um for his off the field uh, basically being a smart captain, dude, smart uh, dude, uh, just being yeah. a great pro, I guess, all together. Um, but injuries was yeah. a concern. He's got to stay uh, healthy. And the one thing he had great power. 
Um, I watched a play in particular yeah. where he ran over the right tackle at least two times in two separate games. Um, and he showcases that kind of elite ability. The one issue with him that I see is his hand usage. Uh, too, yeah. too many times he's letting the offensive uh, tackles and blockers be able to get their hands on him and stop him. That's yeah. awesome because mm-hmm. you think about that, that's, that can be taught. You know, it's not that yes. he doesn't have yes. the talent to do it. It's that he can be taught, and that's that's where it comes into is he a pro. And given what you've heard about mm-hmm. him, I don't see any reason why he can't develop and honestly no. be a no, I integral piece. I think in half the teams in the NFL, he makes the team. I think mm-hmm. he it's, it's wow. without a question – he makes the team as a rotational, uh, rotational uh, either. I don't know. Some people I've heard outside linebacker. I don't see it, um, but I see him as a defensive end. And I think with half the teams, he makes the team. It's not even a question. It's 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 just a value pick that late in the draft. But with the Redskins, unless they start to move some guys, which I don't know, I think we're kind of seeing the vets are on the team. I think that's kind of how it's going to be. And I think it's another reason they've been kind of quiet in the undrafted free agency. They've made a point of saying they don't want to sign too many guys that they know have no chance to make it. So I think he's somebody that just simply based on the numbers game, he'd have to really wow people. And unfortunately, without training camp, and there's going to be question if we're going to even see preseason, we might see you know, an abbreviated training camp with one preseason game. And that preseason game is going to be for guys like him. Right. So it's going to be really hard. This is the toughest year for guys like him, late round guys, undrafted guys. But I think in the end, I love him on the practice squad to develop because a year from now, he could be our fourth, fifth guy. Because I think, you know, you're going to have Ryan Kerrigan, Anderson. There's going to be a couple guys that aren't even going to be on the roster in 2021. So I think, again, another pick for the future. Yeah, and I think Ryan Anderson is definitely going to be regretting uh, his first year not dropping that weight. Uh, when he came into yeah. camp, because uh, that really did set him back. And look, he doesn't really have a position in a four three. Uh, he's not no. he's not blessed right. as a pass rusher enough to be able to make an impact to be here. Um, I think at a, a place like you know Pittsburgh, a linebacker heaven, I think Agreed. he could find a spot in. But here in Washington, I just don't think it's going to be available. He's just not good um, out in space. But you had alluded to undrafted free agency. The Redskins brought in Thad Moss, uh, the tight end, the guy that. A lot of Redskins fans I saw on, on Twitter, their mock drafts had him going in the third and fourth round. They were able to get him as an undrafted free agent, and it got released during mm-hmm. the draft that he had gotten surgery, I think, on his foot, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. I like yeah. I like him coming in as an undrafted free agent. I think they're right there. The sky's the limit for him. He doesn't have an expectation labeled on him. He can step right, right in and develop and hopefully come in and be a, a, a productive player this season. Do you see that happening? I think he, you know, even though we don't think so, I think having the name Moss and, you know, with the, with such a uh, famous father, I think he does have some pressure on him. But I think with what happened with his foot injury, I think, you know, PUP is a likely destination. So I really look at it as prop, a lot of people are, you know, having plans for him now this year. I see a lot of, you know, the Redskins plans for the future. Like he's, you know, um, you know, tight end, tight end two, tight end three for the future. Right now I see him as a tight end three. I liked his blocking. I like what he did with his hands. But I think if you take all to, away that name Moss, honestly, I don't think you have people talking about him because the national championship, great. You know, I think it was two touchdowns. He didn't drop any pass um, the whole year, which is impressive. But before that, I think he played four games at NC State two years prior to coming to LSU. So there's very limited production there. Um, the speed is definitely a concern. Uh, the stiffness is a concern. You know, he show he he shows that he can definitely you know block with some of the best of them. That's what I liked about him is I think that he can be an efficient blocker. But again, it comes down to what are the Redskins envisioning with their tight ends? And I think he's more a play again for the future. Just like a lot of these late round picks on draft to free agents, um, I think people are just going crazy having him third, fourth round. I just think you know we saw with the, what I saw, what you, you and me probably saw, what a lot of the NFL GM saw that he's nowhere near ready he's extremely raw and you know national championship game great but you know he wasn't like 150 yards it wasn't like a jefferson type game you know the fellow receiver you know i think that he had a good game and before that nobody was talking about him so you have to be you know a little weary about performances like that and especially with you know last names that are you know making people think that he's a different kind of player because he doesn't have the ability his father has, and it's not, it's not even close. So this is a pick for the future. Um, I think it's a good guy to mold, and I think his ceiling is a tight end, too. Uh, his likely role for the first year, two years, is a tight end three, because uh, I do think they will keep uh, three tight ends. But um, 
Right now, I think, again, the focal point is going to be, you know, on our backs and receivers and the tight ends are going to just be uh, more blocking options and, uh, you know, some safety blankets for Dwayne Haskins when uh, the plays break down. Yeah, and look, and it's kind of a reversal of things with the Redskins because, you know, when you when you think about the Redskins and tight ends of years past, it's, you know, they're pass catchers, but they can't block. And now it seems like right. we have a plethora of guys that can block, but none that can go out and catch the football. But uh, hopefully we'll find that out this season. Logan and Logan Thomas really upset some people uh, because with Thad Moss, you know, coming in as a good blocker, that's the hard part. You know, as long right. as you can block, right. that's great. But now can you create separation? Can you run the routes? Can you hold on to the football? And that is that time will tell. And maybe given that his athletic right. ability, maybe he, he could be also be a standout in special teams um, is another avenue that he could go down. Maybe he p- wears that kind of hard hat. Um, on his head. Now, Adam, yeah. I want to get from you. Now that the draft is over, uh, let me get your best and worst teams of the draft if you have that ready for me. Yeah, I, uh, I then to me, Denver um, probably had one of the best drafts. Um, I just, you know, Drew Locke was a guy who was extremely co- high coming out of college, and the fact that he went in second round, it's still a shocker to me. I had him way before Dwayne Haskins uh, in the first round last year, and I, again, I'm not going to lie, I was a little disappointed when we didn't grab him, because I had, uh, you know, an early um, second round, I think late, late first round, and Haskins just thought he needed time, but I saw major production from him, and by surrounding him with, you know, talent, being able to get Judy, Jerry Judy from Alabama that late, and then doubling up and going K.J. Hamler, which a lot of people are talking about, a Deshaun Jackson clone. Yeah. Man, I think it was great. And then what do you do? You give him his tight end blanket with Albert O., his former tight end in Missouri. So to me, it's not even close. They had the best draft. Um, I'm still looking through a lot of teams, but early on, I think the Giants had a ton of reaches. I think they had an opportunity <laughs> to really, really get better. And I didn't, again, Thomas from Georgia, he's a solid offensive lineman. I had him as my fringe second, third, um, because I just thought Worfs from Iowa was the closest I've seen to Trent Williams coming out, just an athletic freak, yep. a guy that you can move all along the line. And I think as a Redskins fan, I'm happy because I think Chase Young, if he's going to be going against him or even Montez Sweat, I think they're going to feast on him because he is very good. He's technically sound. But he did show he had issues with, you know, speed rushers and, you know, guys around the edge. So I think, you know, you widen that that front. I think he's going to have problems. And, you know, they were really underwhelming from a lot of the picks they did. They didn't blow anybody away. Um, I, I'm sure that there's worse than that. But I focus mainly on the NFC East with a lot of my evaluations uh, lately. Still, you know, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be looking at every team's player pick by pick by pick. But my early one, I just thought Giants, I who – the players that were on the board, they could have done way better. So, you know, Denver's my best and right for right now, to me the Giants are the worst. Yeah, and I know it's it's kind of uh, ridiculous to do so so early after the draft cuz obviously none of these processes have shaped out yet, but it's just fun to theorize right. um because you know with Denver it was fun to see that because you could kind of see them trying to compete with Kansas City, uh trying to at right. least get some firepower on offense so they could compete and score 30 points a game and Showing what Drew Locke did last season, I mean, pairing Jerry Judy with, uh, with Hamler, I mean, that is going to be very deadly. Awesome. And, that, and that leads to my team. And I know a lot of people don't agree with the Arnett move, but I loved what they did with wide receiver. Um, going to yeah. get Lynn Bowden, a guy who I watched uh, film on, who literally did everything. He stepped in at quarterback yeah. after an injury. Yeah, he's uh, good. And was yeah. still a slot receiver. And then they also get Brian Edwards. And so it's kind of crazy that they really stacked up their offense in one draft where they got their slot guy. Right. They got their number two wide receiver, Brian Edwards. They already have uh, Waller there, and they had their quarterback and running game. I thought the Raiders did a, mm-hmm. had a fantastic draft, in my opinion. Yeah, Henry Ruggs, I, a lot of people were shocked. I wasn't that shocked. I was just shocked how long it took for Judy and Lamb to go. Yeah. But I, yeah. I really said in the beginning when I was doing my, my different big boards, my first big board, I had Ruggs right behind Judy. Later on, it was Judy, Lamb, and Ruggs. But it's talking about very little distance between them because people really typecasted Ruggs as just a burner, you know, 4 two speed. But he's a lot more than that. Again, yeah. I'm an Alabama fan, so I watched all of their tape. And I don't think that they went wrong. I think that, you know, Gruden and Mayock out there have a specific plan, what they want to do. And speed was definitely part of it. You know, with Waller, you know, like you said, with Edwards and now Bowden, they have that speed, height, 
um, you know, guy that's going to tough guy that's going to go over the middle film. I think they had a hell of a draft too, but I think a lot of people just really got stuck on, you know, the hunt that they reached on rugs. Rugs was not a reach. It was just a matter of your preference with those first three receivers. It's a preference issue. It's just exactly, it was, it was shocking that a lot of them fell that far, but yeah, you, you said it. I have a friend that's a Raiders fan. And he, he was really happy. And there was an argument on Twitter about, you know, that they really reached. And this was a, you know, a, a true Al Davis move. And I had to disagree. I said, you know, and the, somebody mentioned uh, Darius Hayward Bay. I said, you're so wrong. Mm -hmm. Darius Hayward Bay is not even in the class of Henry Ruggs. But, yeah, man, they had a hell of a draft. Yeah, the, I said, uh, the funny thing is, I said, when we did our mock draft, um, it's funny on the podcast, because I, CeeDee Lamb and Jerry Judy had already been picked in the mock draft. But I had the right. Raiders at 13. I picked them with Henry Ruggs there. And I said, you know, the Al Davis effect of him loving, you know, the big speedy guys that go getting touchdowns, the Darius Hayward Bay if you will and rugs running a 4-2 it almost feels like a perfect match uh for the two yeah. of them and the one thing with yeah. rugs though that that really pointed out to me because I, I think you're right about that i don't think he is just a a, a go route only type of wide receiver because when you talk about guys yeah. like that you're talking about brittle guys and henry yeah. rugs is not brittle he he was, was very tough. consistent and tough guy and i don't see him being like an injury concern or anything i thought the raiders absolutely destroyed in a, in a draft with a wide receiver heavy i thought they absolutely knocked it out of the park in that round yeah, it's it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting what they got going over there because you know again they went Alabama last year when they got their running back so you know he was I think was it run was he runner up rookie of the year I'm, I'm not, I don't remember but um you know they have a solid offensive game plan going on there um you know again I think last year I would question a lot more of their picks I think they had some reaches last year. Um, but I think, you know, they definitely had a good draft and, um, you know, going to Vegas, I think, you know, they're definitely, they have an offense that's going to, you know, excite some people. Yeah. And then the other team, the dark horse that a lot of people are talking about is the San Francisco 49ers, uh, being yeah. able to go get Trent Williams and then getting, uh, oh, I forgot his name, Kinlaw, uh, to mm -hmm. replace, um, uh, DeForest Buckner was a, a slam dunk by them. Kyle Shanahan is just doing whatever he wants out there in the NFC West. Right. Yeah. A lot of people aren't talking about that. They're, they're, uh, a lot of people were really talking high on Kinlaw in the beginning, but there are a bit of injury concerns. Um, I believe it was some, some prior knee issues that, that most teams did not really red flag, but there were a few that did. So I think that, you know, they're not going to miss a ton, but I think that they will feel it. I don't think that you're personally, I don't think you're going to see him repeat this year and be back in the Super Bowl. Um, I think that they definitely got better in some aspects. And as far as Trent Williams goes, I don't think he's on the downside of career his career whatsoever, and he'll definitely play motivated. But let's not forget, the guy had a lot of injuries. Yes, and, you know, to think that he's going to come in and he's going to be a 14-16 game starter but after missing this much time, there's a difference between being in shape and being in football shape. Yeah. And he's been out of the game for a long time. So I personally, just my early prediction, I think he's going to uh, trend downwards. And I think that... He's not going to show enough, and don't even be surprised if he becomes a free agent after this year and they don't extend him because they got him on a one-year rental. I wouldn't be surprised if you know he just doesn't really perform. And you know he's tough; he'll play through some injuries. Yeah. But um, you know I'm happy that we're going to probably be in seeing. Hopefully, we're going to see Chase Young, you know, going against him when we play in San Francisco this year. Yeah, and uh, I, you know, I want to. I don't want to be negative about the whole situation. Uh, it just kind of sucks the way that he handled it with the Vikings. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you know. Yeah. What? But, you know, when, when players want to sit here and cry about how situations are played out, look, it's a business, man. And the, these yeah. are the way things go. And on either right. side, either side has a position to be able to do this. And, right. look, Trent did it. And he, look, he did what he wanted to do. And all of us sitting at home would probably do right. it in our best interest. And he wanted to go with Kyle Shanahan and uh, – more power. To I think him. that's what it was. Yeah. I don't think it. I don't think it was about not wanting to go to Minnesota. Yeah. I think you know. I heard people just rumors, of course, but there was conver there's, there was conversations going back, you know, over a month ago with his agent and him and Kyle Shanahan and Lynch over in San Francisco, and I think they were just trying to leverage it as much as possible. And I yeah. heard that it was just yeah, a sorry, lot of low ball offers. Down. Yeah. I thought I heard it was just a lot of low ball offers coming from San Francisco early on. So it wasn't even consideration. It was, you know, a lot of people were talking about Cleveland. We blew it. But from what I heard, the most Cleveland really offered was a third, fourth. And that was dating back to last year. So the market really wasn't what it was. I just you had Bruce. You had um, Bruce Allen negotiated last year. If you had Kyle Smith, I have no doubt we could have probably got a first at worst, a second round. But I think after that went by, his value just really devalued so much. 
to get a fifth this year and a third next year. I love that we have a third next year. To me, that's ammunition now that if they really see somebody that they really like, they're going to move up into the second round with that extra pick. So, you know, I think for them, you know, it was starting to look like we weren't going to get anything and we we're going to mm-hmm. try to force him to play, which a lot of people on uh, on Twitter are talking about, oh, just bring him in, force him to play. If he's going to sit, sit. That's not a good situation for a new coach, a new regime, a new culture. Yeah. So, you know, I think in the end, San Francisco probably got the better end of it. But in the end, for us to get what we got, I'm, I'm happy. I think, you know, I'm glad that we're moving on. I love Trent Williams. It takes two. And I think both sides were an issue. And I'm glad that it's just over. And, you know, we can look ahead to the future because I think this team really has, um, you know, some pieces to be excited about, especially on the defensive line. Oh, absolutely. And the one thing um, I, I, I took away from that, like, it's not that the Redskins botched it. It's just it's a perfect storm. It's an accumulation right. of things. It's the fact that it was a very tackle heavy draft and. And the right. fact that Trent sat out last season uh, right. and possibly sitting out again this year. So that's what kind of ruined his value. And we said it back in January when we were going devaluing this draft and single left tackle saying, wow, the Redskins are in a bad spot now. Um, and unfortunately, that's where they are. But they were able to get something in return. And look, a third right. round next year, as, long, as much as we poo-poo it now, next draft, we're all going to be thanking the Lord for it. I can guarantee it. Right, right, right. Yep. No, I think it's 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 just it was time to move on. It's sta- It's time to you know. If anything came out a good came out good about this whole thing, is it got Bruce Allen fired. Yeah. So I think if we want to take a win, you know, you want we want to value draft picks, we want to value everything. There's no value on getting rid of Bruce Allen. That was the biggest issue controversy I've ever seen as a Redskins fan, and we've sure had a lot of them. Yeah. So for for this to result in Allen being fired and like the way he did it, everyone thought you know Snyder would be staying friends with him. He'd be moved to the you know stadium right. the department, and I think you know, it was the best case scenario. So I think that's what fans need to remember. He got Bruce Allen fired. Yeah, and uh, before we got on this podcast, I was actually listening to J.P. Finley uh, from NBC Sports Washington. He was on with Chad Dukes uh, on 106.7 The Fan, and he actually had alluded to, and he made a really good point. He thought that Redskins fans should really pay attention to the fact that Ron Rivera was able to convince the powers that be to send Trent to Kyle Shanahan. Uh, knowing yeah, the that's relationship, huge. Knowing the relationship between the Shanahans and the Snyders and how bad that got, and, they, and Snyder said he would not, trade to Kyle he would not trade Trent or Kirk yep. to Kyle Shanahan the fact that Ron Rivera and Kyle Smith were able to get that done I think JP's right it speaks volumes to how much respect this front office has right now yeah that's 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 you know I'm glad you alluded to that that that's huge because after the whole breakup with Shanahan you know it was Allen and Snyder were adamant that we probably thought there was going to be no deals or any kind of discussions with the 49ers (laughs) for the rest of the time that they were part of that organization. So, you know, a lot of people are saying, well, it's a matter of time before Snyder gets involved. I don't think personally, I don't think so. I think we'll see enough success over the next two, three years that he'll get a long leash. And I think Snyder will see the fan base slowly start to come back. It's going to be difficult this year with questions of the stadium and how they're going to get people in there and the social distancing. But I think in the end, it's going to be best for the organization. And it's just, you know, it's going to gain some respect for our team around the league. It's going to take time. But Rivera is highly respected around the league. I think Kyle Smith is viewed as one of the top young minds in the NFL. And don't be surprised if he's going to be named, um, you know, the general manager in the in the weeks and months to come. Because I think I've been talking about him the second I heard about him, the scout scouting department, and just seeing him talk and read some articles that he put, you know, the interviews he was on. And man, this guy's—he's a true talent evaluator. You know, when we were out, you know, playing ball and you know running around, you know, causing you know mischief, this guy was in the film room with his father, who AJ Smith was with. The Chargers for a while, and this is just what he does. This is what he loves to do. So in his spare time, this is what he does. So, man, I think I think this team is going in the right direction. Cautiously optimistic is where we need to stay, but I think this draft made us better. Yeah, and I love the idea of bringing Kyle Smith in as GM. Um, I know that Lewis Riddick did uh like train you and everything, but I just I was I was against that uh, bringing Lewis Riddick as the GM just because I thought he was kind of advocating for the GM job and I thought that he would kind of appease to Dan Snyder in a way. But I love this idea of things because in the Redskins pass and organization wise, they allow guys out of the building instead of promoting. 
You know, they'd rather pay big money to bring a guy in for a position rather than promoting from within. If they were able to do that with Kyle Smith, I think that would be the biggest indicator that we are on new chartered grounds with Redskins fans and that there is a new reason to be excited because this organization headed by Kyle Smith, the way that he's run the draft the past three times, uh, three years, I I think that we're in very, very good hands. Yeah, I think, it, and it's also just the way he meshes with Rivera. Yeah. How they were talking about, you know, how they get along. You know that they they continually, if not talking every day, they were talking every other day. Mm-hmm. Um, I just think having a head coach GM relationship, which we really haven't seen here, uh, probably since Joe Gibbs. You know, in the beginning, you know, the first turnaround when he was here. Yeah. Um, I think we just haven't had that, and I think it just doesn't go with drafting. It goes in with free agency. It just goes in with everything you know and just like little details about you know people have been talking about the field conditions and these are the little things that you know these two guys can get in place and you know we're still going to be in the stadium for a little bit but like the field has always been an issue injuries have happened but they'll be able to help little things like that and i think right now kyle smith is doing pro and college personnel so he's doing a lot of the gm roles but sliding him into that gm role is going to give him a lot more responsibility and a lot more clout so I think that, honestly, if they don't do it, I don't think they're going to fill it with somebody else. I just think that, you know, there are some teams around the league that, you know, don't have a, a quote-unquote GM. But I think that that's, that's going to happen. I think they just want to wait till the draft and, you know, see how this goes. But I think to have him and Rivera, you know, basically running this franchise for the most part, keeping Snyder in the loop, which is a smart thing to do. Yeah. I, I think, you know, we're heading in the right direction. Again, cautiously optimistic, um, but heading in the right direction. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I said about this, uh, said this on the live stream on Saturday. You know, when you talk about the draft and prospects coming in, every single prospect has positives. They have aspects of their games that can be built on. But what right. is stopping them from reaching that that point, that potential? And that's where it comes in the relationship between the people drafting the players and the people that are progressing those players. And if they have right. a very good relationship – they're on the same page, then that means they're more likely to reach that potential. And that's, I think, was the disconnect with this Redskins team for almost 20 years. Was that dysfunction between general manager and head coach? Because when you think about with Jay Gruden and Dwayne Haskins, a perfect example. Uh, A head coach that didn't want that draft pick at quarterback, and look what, he didn't care about him. He didn't progress him at all, didn't teach him up, he didn't care. Nothing. That's the kind, that's how you ruin prospects. I'm glad that that's finally changed in, in Ashburn. Yeah, and then I, I interviewed actually a former uh, teammate of his, uh, um, Matt Burrell, who was his center at Ohio State before mm. transferring to Sam Houston. They're actually best friends. And, you know, us as fans, we know that it affected him. But what he explained to me, you know, some on the record, some off the record, that basically, you know, it was a lot worse than we think as far as the way Jay was him. Jay made it abundantly clear he didn't like him. He didn't want to be around him and he didn't want to develop him. So it was a lot more than just about not getting him reps. It went deeper. It went on a, on a human to human level. Right. And personally, you know, I saw some things that were a little unsettling with Jay Gruden that came out, you know, with him, you know, um, you know, drinking. And he was, he was like, you know, there was like a video that came out where I think it was at, um, Adams Morgan or somewhere. And yeah. the girl looked like she couldn't have been 17, 18 years old. Yeah. And he was just like, you know, I get there are people too. They're just like us. I get it. But to me, you're the head coach of, a, of uh, the national football league. It was a bad look. I think, you know, in the end, he's a very immature person, you know, maybe that'll change, but I think we get the complete opposite in Rivera. We get, yeah. you know, a military mindset, somebody that, you know, is no BS and, Again, I don't know how great of a coach in the end is going to be, but I think we have a, finally have a situation where he will be the head coach, uh, Turner will run the office, and Del Rio will run the defense. This is how it's supposed to be, and this is how it was when the Redskins had success. Gibbs was involved in the past with the offense, but he let his coordinators do what they're supposed to do and what they're good at. And I think that's exactly – that's probably what gets me the most excited about next season is I think all these roles are going to be delegated, and I think he's just going to demand discipline. And, you know, granted we moved out Dunbar and Trent Williams. People can complain about value, but he said if you're not with the program – you're not going to be here. And I think he stuck to his word. So um, I'm excited. Yeah, I think you're 100% right about that because, you know, when you think about a head coach at this level or a manager for baseball, a lot of the times it's just them managing the people. Um, right. Less, less about the actual aspect and the uh, management of the game uh, where Joe Gibbs, you know, dealing with people, that was his specialty. Uh, specialty. Right. And with Ron Rivera, that seems to be the same thing. I, me- I remember that Devin Funches video about his brother passing away or his cousin right. passing away, I believe, and him reaching to him on that level. 
Um, yeah. Now, that being said, I wanted to pick your brain because you had just alluded to this. Real quick, the last thing we'll get into. Now, since the draft is over, I want to see what your mind is and where you think the Reds can stand for next season because I'm not sure about you. I still think this is a 500 ball club. I think just mm. what you had alluded to before with Jay Gruden and his uh, disdain for Dwayne Haskins, if you will, um, just it being an anomaly. We have not seen yeah. this. This is a good football team that all they needed – was an identity. They needed a kick in right. the butt. They needed a, a fire lit under their rear end, and that's what Ron Rivera brings. I think this is a very good team, and if Scott Turner is as good as we think he is, if he's half as good as right. his dad, we could be a 500 ball club depending on how well Dwayne Haskins turns out. Agree that that that's where I see us head in ICS and you know the eight wins could be you know most likely you know I think Vegas had us at a spread at four and a half yeah. games and I personally think and it's not about Chase Young's just his ability I think the attention he's going to draw yeah my my early take is I think Montez Sweat is going to have the best year of anybody on our defense I think you're going to be looking at a 12 13 plus sack year for him and I think immediately that gives us two games we went three games so to say that we're going to be in the 500 range. That's about right to me. You know, if a couple things go right, you know, we could be eight, nine wins with the new CBA. There's an extra pl- there two two playoff spots. Um, I could see us challenging. Um, but Dallas got really good. I think the Eagles improved, uh, right. especially on their speed at receiver. Uh, so they're going to have their work cut out for them. But I think, you know, they they made a dedication to continually upgrading this defensive line. I think when teams are going to throw a lot of at the Redskins on offense, we're going to be able to counter uh, with fresh bodies coming in and out, in and out. And I'm just, I'm excited what we can do. The offense, we don't have an identity. So like you said, once we do an identity, you know, then we can talk about in 2021, you know, are we going to make a run for the division as it stands right now? We would definitely need, you know, a bunch of things to fall our way to be, you know, in contention. But again, man, this is NFL. You never know what happens, you know, a couple injuries here and there, you know, you have Dak Prescott go down who's behind him. You know, you know, Philadelphia, that's what makes me a little nervous. Carson Wentz goes down. They got Jalen Hurst. And I, I really liked him. I was really high me on too. him. So I think that they could do some damage to me. The Giants, I think they're still the bottom. I don't think they did enough. I think that, you know, we can counteract what they did in the draft. So 500, that that's probably, you know, the most realistic stance to be at right now. Yeah, I think you're right about that. And the funny thing you said about Jalen Hurts, uh, when I broke down his film, uh, the funny thing, I made a comment on Facebook, and I said, you know, I would love to see a team use uh, Jalen Hurts how the Saints use Taysom Hill. And uh, I think that's how the Eagles are going to basically use him. uh, Because of Carson Wentz's injury history, trying to keep him upright and safe as much as possible, it makes sense to keep him off the field a little bit. And Jalen Hurts, I think, in an an Eagles uniform with what they have there, it's not going to be fun for us, but – where the Redskins are weak going into the season. You're talking about the cornerback position. You could possibly say safety. I don't believe that 100. Yeah. percent But Chase Young in that defensive front fixes that. You know, they, I agree. They, they stifle they make that them ability. Better. Yeah, and so that's why I think this team is better than what people are giving them credit for. And I think Ron Rivera is, is going to honestly be coach of the year next year based on how well this team turns around. Yeah, I think if if you're not producing, you know, Jay would just stick with guys. I think if you're not producing. He's going to pull you out, and I think he showed that in Carolina with a lot of you know the guys that he you know they stuck to and kept playing, and you know, and they didn't have the greatest success all the time. But I don't think that can always be put on you know where Rivera was coming from. But I think he's in a better situation now to have a defensive coordinator like Jack Del Rio because he has somebody with head coaching experience that just gets it. So I think that that alone that'll make us competitive in in, in every single game. And Dwayne Haskins, I see him taking the next step this year. Uh, ceiling, I couldn't tell you. You know, I think at worst to me, he's going to be a service quarter, serviceable quarterback at best. I think he can he can get us to the playoffs. Um, as far as you know, how great he's going to be, you know, it's all about his work ethic and how much yeah. he wants it. But um, I think we're trending in the right direction. I think we we upgraded uh, some positions we needed. And um, again, I'm a firm believer. I don't think it's over this time of year. You know, a bunch of names come available, and you know the Redskins have done that in the past, grabbing Deshaun Jackson. You know, other players late in the uh, off season. So I, you know, second in the NFL with cap uh, room. I don't think we're done. No, I don't think we're done either. And uh, and, spe- and like I don't want to. I'm not a Dwayne Haskins hater by any stretch. I did, was not impressed with him last season. But the mm-hmm. one thing that he, I said, he can win me back easily by working yeah. hard. And he's right. he, he's shown that this off yeah. season. And that's all I've wanted was last. I, I was very. Not, I was not impressed. I thought that he was a wasted pick at 15. But if he works hard and if he can produce the way that he everyone is talking about, it, I I really truly believe in this kid. 
It's just, right. can you put your mind to it and can you work hard to do it? And Ron Rivera is going to get that out of people. I'm not sure right. if, if anyone's realized that by now, but that's what he does. He motivates guys. And yep. uh, I think this team is going to be a very, very good team heading in the future. Agree. Agree, man. All right. Well, thank you so much, Adam. I appreciate you coming on here. Always a pleasure, man. I just to let you know the, the the viewers out there, you can catch my stuff at burgundyandgoldreport.wordpress.com. I'm going to have a new segment coming out called Hail Rookie. I'm going to go through um, each of our rookies. Um, the Chase Young has been done to death, so you know we'll just skip over that and just go a little more in depth some of the stuff we talked about tonight. Um, just go in depth about you know what I saw from the film, some of these guys, and my uh, perceived role, um, what I see going forward. So um, even though it's the off season, you know, with the you know pandemic, a lot of stuff's in the air. Man, just stay tuned. A lot of content's going to be coming. Hopefully, you know, we'll be able to, you know, link up again. We'll do another show, my man. Absolutely, Adam. I appreciate you coming on, guys. Go follow him on at the Banji Report on Twitter. Thank you so much for tuning in, everybody. Until next time, Redskins football. Woo!